Well, it's great to see a lot of faces I haven't seen in a while. It's great that the Bible study is getting back. For you guests, we're studying the scripture straight through. Um, this Bible study has been meeting for over 40 years. Uh, Gary Kinder was the founder, and uh, he taught for 37. I've had it for the last three, so we're we're enjoying the scripture and. You know, one of the, the great joys of teaching this Bible study is, of course, getting deep into the scriptures, but people send me very interesting stuff all week long. <laughs> and some of it's really interesting, some of it's uh, uh, a little far out, and some of it is funny as can be. So these are from Carol Haley who hasn't been here in a year. Uh, her and Jim have, you know, fears of the virus because of their pre-existing issues. So we're, uh, we're glad that Debbie, our producer, thank you, Debbie, uh, puts these on YouTube every week. So we have a lot of people that watch the, the class and the music. And I also want to thank Jim O'Connor. Every week he comes early, sets everything up. Oh, great guy. But uh, these are from Carol. And it said, due to my isolation, I finished three books yesterday. And believe me, that's a lot of coloring. <laughs> what, what did our parents do to kill boredom before the internet? I asked my 26 brothers and sisters, and they didn't know either. <laughs> my boss arrived at work yesterday in a brand new Lamborghini. I said, wow, that's an amazing car. He replied, if you work hard and put all your hours in, and strive for excellence. I'll get another one next year. <laughs> I, I can identify with this one. Struggling to get your wife's attention? Just sit down and look comfortable. <laughs> Dad's email, son, allow me to offer my warmest congratulations. I'm certain you'll remember today as the happiest day of your life. Thanks, Dad, but the wedding's tomorrow. Dad, I know. <laughs> and then finally, uh, Randy will like this one, said, I grew up with Bob Hope, Steve Jobs, and Johnny Cash. Now there's no jobs, no cash, and no hope. Please, God, don't let anything happen to Kevin Bacon. <laughs> so I like that from Carol. Well, if you take your uh, outline, we'll review what we studied last week. We did, we're in the book of Exodus. We did chapters 21 and 22. <laughs> Last week, today, we're going to study Exodus 23 and 24. But the things we learned last week, the Mosaic laws, God has laid down the Ten Commandments verbally. He's also spelling out the ordinances for the people. And there's about two and a half million Hebrews gathered around Mount Sinai. So that's where we are in the study. But the Mosaic laws were mostly to be enforced by judges, not individuals. Society needs respect for the laws and trust their neighbors to have a civil way of life. These laws are also to be enforced with some compassion. And we read how Jesus addressed these in Matthew 5, 38 to 48. And then note that God respects unborn children 
and endows them with rights. He also despises sorcery, witchcraft, and the occult. So if you open your Bible to Exodus chapter 23, and we go through the study line by line, and then we review the highlights in your outline at the end of each chapter. And this is God speaking to Moses. I have the red letter edition, so I know this is directly from God. You shall not raise a false report. Put not your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Tell the truth. Be honest. You shall not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shall you speak in a cause to decline after many to pervert judgment. And we see what's happening in Minnesota right now. People can't wait to get out and cause mayhem. Neither shall you countenance a poor man in his cause. God is not a respecter of persons. He has told, warned the rich. He has warned not to judge and give favor to the poor either. You do what's right. And if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. You take care of your neighbor whether you like him or not. And if you see the donkey of him that hates you lying under his burden, won't get up and would forbear to him if you would uh, hesitate to help him, you will help him. It's your responsibility whether you like them or not. Verse six, you shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his cause. You don't show favoritism to the rich either. Keep you far from a false matter and the innocent and righteous slay you not for I will not justify the wicked. And you shall take no gift for the gift blinds the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. You're not to take a bribe, okay? He got a saying, you do not accept money to bend the truth. Verse nine, you'll also not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, but you were strangers in Egypt for 400 years. Verse 10, in six years you shall sow your land, so you will cultivate the land, you will grow your agriculture. He knows that the Jews are going to be an agricultural society, and you'll gather the fruits of your labor. But the seventh year, you shall let it rest and be still. Now, this Let's the land not be depleted of all the nutrients. God knew best. You got to let the land rest for a year so you're not cultivating all the nutrients out of the land. And that the poor of your people can help themselves to whatever grows wild. And they leave the beasts of the field, shall they? And in like manner, you'll deal with your vineyard and your olive yard. So six years, you grow the heck out of your crops. The seventh year, you let it rest. Verse 12, six days you shall do your work. And on the seventh day, you shall rest. And your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your handmaid, and any stranger can be refreshed. You've got to have some time off. You can't. Now, Gary Kinder always used to say, six days shalt thou work. <laughs> uh, a lot of people wanted it four or five, you know, at the most. But six days and the seventh day, you rest. And in all things I have said to you to be careful, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods. Neither let it be heard out of your mouth. Don't have idols, no idol worship. Three times you'll keep a feast to me in the year. God is establishing the order for centuries to come for the people. And you'll keep the feast to him three times a year. You'll keep the feast of unleavened bread, the Passover. And you shall eat unleavened bread seven days 
So as I commanded you in the time appointed of the month of Abib, and which is uh, the first month of the Jewish calendar, for in it you came out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. So bring your offerings too when you come to these feasts. And the feast of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors. This is Pentecost he's talking about. And Jesus went to all three of these feasts every year. These are required of the males in Israel. And you have sown in the field and the feast of ingathering. That's the end of the harvest, which is also called the feasts of booths or Sukkoth. But that is the three feasts. Verse 17, three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. People say, well, what about the women? Well, the women are probably taking care of all the kids while the men go down to Jerusalem. And you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. Again, we studied leaven is considered sin, an analogy for sin throughout scripture. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Neither shall the food of my sacrifice remain until the morning. So when they would sacrifice an ox, they would offer the sacrifice and then have a feast. So they didn't waste anything. This is an interesting verse, verse 19. And the first of the first fruits, first fruits of your land, you shall bring it to the house of the Lord. You're to offer your best first to the Lord's work. And you shall not seize a kid, a kid, goat, or lamb in his mother's milk. Now, I had to research that. I had to figure out what in the world they're talking about here. But apparently the Canaanites were an extremely cruel people. And they would do rituals like this where they would take even children and do this. But they would take the animals and do that. Now, the, the Jews formed an opinion here that still lasts to today. And that's that you don't mix meat and dairy. You don't eat it together. And that's the verse where they first picked this up. And I remember visiting Donna's grandmother who kept kosher. And she was wonderful lady, just a very godly woman. And she said, uh, can I make you something to eat? I said, of course, <laughs> I'm always hungry. <laughs> Uh, so she said, well, how about a salami sandwich? I said, that sounds great. She goes, what do you want on it? I said, mayonnaise. She goes, not in my house. <laughs> and verse 20, behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and bring you into the place I have prepared. Now, the Hebrews are about three and a half to four months out of Egypt. They're going to be wandering for 40 years. So God is preparing all these people, these ordinances, the rules and regulations. He's given the Ten Commandments. So sin, Randy, is now imputed to the people. They know what's right and what's wrong. Before the commandments and the law was given, it was all kind of nebulous. But now it's specific. And this angel that he sends, a lot of the commentaries said it's probably an archangel like Michael. Other commentaries said it's the pre-incarnate Christ who would actually lead the children of Israel to the promised land. Verse 21, beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression for him. My name is in him. He is representing God Almighty, Jehovah. But if you shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, 
that I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angels shall go before you and bring you to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Now, I don't know about you, I haven't met any Jebusites lately. I just haven't bumped into any. But I certainly know a lot of the Jewish people. Verse 24, And you shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break down their images. They would have pagan worship services. They called them the high places. And they would actually sacrifice children to the god Molech. And so he's saying, tear all this down. We're going to just purify the land. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he'll bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. He promises them tremendous blessing for obedience. There shall nothing cast their young nor be barren. They aren't going to have any miscarriages if they obey. They're not going to have any problems reproducing. There shall be nothing barren in your land. The number of your days I will fulfill. And I will send my fear before you and will destroy all the people to whom you shall come and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you their reputation is going to precede them and it's going to cause the enemies to fear tremble disperse not fight it's uh, paving the way for these two and a half million hebrews and i will send hornets before you now that's interesting are these these killer hornets that i've been reading about <laughs> gonna Go before you and shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. Now, verse 29 is interesting. I will not drive them out in one year, lest the land becomes desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against you. I'm not going to do all this at once. This is going to be a process. You're going to have to digest your progress piece by piece. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you be increased. He wants them to be a royal priesthood, but also a very formidable army. He wants them strong before they get to king. And I will set the bounds from the Red Sea even to the Sea of the Philistines, the Mediterranean Sea, and from the desert to the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor their gods. You're not to be unequally yoked with the people who are wicked and that applies today in business in marriage in nuclear treaties you name it that is not to happen they shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me for if you serve their gods it will surely be a snare to you and unfortunately they didn't listen careful as we'll see in the future. But if you take your outline, uh, we just read the purple lines, the highlights of the chapter. Truthfulness in trials is imperative. This is setting the course for Western um, judicial process. You, know, you're, used to be, you had to swear on the Bible to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Now they kind of... Eh, you know, whatever you want, whatever you feel like. Never join a riotous multitude. Do not show partiality to anyone in any matter, whether rich or poor. 
Do the right thing even if someone dislikes you. Be honest in all matters and don't ever take bribes to lie. Be kind to strangers. After six years of harvest, let the land rest for the seventh year and also feed the poor. There were so many provisions all through scripture to take care of the poor. And then remember the Sabbath. Let everyone rest and refresh with a day off and never give thanks to anyone but the Lord God, Jehovah. Three annual feasts, three feasts to the Lord are sacred. Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost, the first fruit harvest, and the tabernacles, booths, or the ingathering, it's also called, that's the end of the growing year. So those three feasts, all the males are to be present at the temple. Give your first fruits to the Lord and don't do demonic cruel rituals that the Canaanites do. And the angel and the promises. A strong angel will precede them to the promised land. Be obedient and God will be there fighting for them. We're going to study some major battle victories. God will deliver the promised land and rid the pagans from Israel. Serve God and he will bless your food and water and health. God will intimidate their enemies before them and they'll flee. Little by little, he'll drive their enemies out so they can digest their progress adequately. The Jews' land will be from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. And then get rid of all the pagan inhabitants, lest they tempt the Hebrews to sin. No treaties or covenants that could lead to idol worship. And now we get to chapter 24. This is a very powerful, powerful chapter in all of Scripture. And God said to Moses, come up to the Lord. Now they're camped around Mount Sinai, and he calls Moses to come up towards the top. You and Aaron... Nadab and Abihu. Now, who are those two? Those are Aaron's two sons. God knows you by name. He names them specifically. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come too close. Neither shall the masses of people come up. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. And that just goes to prove the saying, talk is cheap. Because in just a short period of time, this is going to change. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Moses took 40 years to write the first five books of the Bible. He wrote what God told him verbatim. He wrote it down clear. And he rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. They're organized by the 12 tribes. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings and oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. And half of the blood he sprinkled on that altar he just built. And he took the book of the covenant, what he's written so far, and read in the audience of the people. And again they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant. This is starting the covenant which portrays Christ in the future. The blood is 
the life is in the blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. Now, if you keep your place here, but turn to Hebrews chapter 9. The Apostle Paul makes this all very clear. Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll start in verse 19. Thank you, Donna. Did I look comfortable? <laughs> yeah, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19. And I'm going to finish it through the chapter here. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and the people. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heaven should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. It's going to be a sacrifice for one time. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He is saying, they're mine. They're mine. They were bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ nor yet that he should have to offer himself often the high priest had to do that as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others on the day of atonement for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once one time in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed to men, once to die, there's no reincarnation, there's no second chance, once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and I put many, not all, many, those that are called and those that accept that gift. And to them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So the apostle really gives a great treatise on what Moses started and Jesus finished. Verse uh, 9 back in Exodus, chapter 24, verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. They saw him, and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in its clearness. So they're not allowed to get too close, but from a distance they can see the majesty of the Lord God Elohim. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid on his hand, he let them get somewhat close, not too close, they didn't want to, he didn't want to have to, to harm them. And they saw God, and they even stayed and had a picnic. They did the eat and drink too. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me unto the mount and be there, and I will give you the tables of stone. Now he gave the Ten Commandments verbally. Now he's going to give Moses 
written with the finger of God and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. He wanted Moses to teach the people so that they in turn would teach their children and their children would teach their children. It's important that people are taught about the word of God. And Moses rose up and has ministered Joshua. Joshua is his general. He's the only guy that he takes with him as he goes up to the top of Mount Sinai. And then if you saw the Ten Commandments at Egypt, uh, Easter, uh, that was portrayed. Joshua waited for Moses closer. And he said to the elders, you stay here until we come back again to you. And behold, I'm leaving Aaron and her with you. So you got two of my best people. If any man have any matter to do, let him come to them. So I'm going to be unavailable for a while. And Moses went up into the mount and a cloud covered the mount and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. So all these two and a half million people are looking up and seeing this amazing sight that Moses is heading into. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and he got him to the top of the mountain and Moses was in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And I wrote in my Bible, uh-oh, he's going to be gone for 40 days and 40 nights. And these children of Israel are thinking he isn't coming back. And so we'll study what goes on, but I know it involves a golden cake coming up. Questions and comments? Okay, so two comments. I love this lesson. I, mean, I love the Bible, but some chapters. Um, one first one is that, um, you know, when God, God gives you instruction, you better be ready to follow up with that, on that. Because he listed all the names of the nations that he wanted to be exterminated. Yes. I don't, you don't ask questions, you know. Oh, it is so, how are you going to do that? You know, but he, God said so. He knew how wicked and how far beyond um, any trying of salvation was not there for these people. And there would um, be a problem to the future generations, right? Yes. So get this, the researchers now, they have found through DNA a connection of the Canaanites to these days. There are people here who are descendants of the Canaanites. Yeah, because they didn't and, do they didn't finish yeah, the job. They did not, and guess what where they are? Interestingly, they live in the Zagro Mountains, which is in Iran. And these people they want always to exterminate Israel mm -hmm. or wipe it off the map, right? So you know you see, God tells you to do something, do it. Because there's a reason for that, right? And the other one that I, I when you took us to Hebrew, um, you know, sometimes it is hard to understand, but the Bible is like a connecting dot. You read one thing and then there's an answer and another. So up to Jesus, all the priests were from the tribe of Levi. Levi. Jesus came and he's from the tribe of Judah, mm -hmm. right? And it was like, you cannot be a priest. Well, the scripture says that he is from the order of Melchizedek priest so, and king yes a priest and king in a different order so the book of Hebrew tells me that when there is a change in priesthood which had never happened before that must be a change in the law and guess what when Jesus came there was a change in the law fulfilling the uh, prophecy of Jeremiah that says that he will write the law in your heart 
And that's exactly what Jesus that's did. That's the new covenant. Yeah. And the high priest, when Jesus was crucified, was absolutely corrupt. <laughs> and so that covenant, that new covenant, began yeah. with Christ's yes. sacrifice. Very good. Any other questions? Marilyn. I had forgotten, I've been told, but how many laws were the Jews expected to obey back in these days? Uh, well, in these days, it wasn't near as many as they added, but it was over 600 okay. laws. I knew when, it was an unbelievable Yeah, number. and God talks about that. He says, you know, you have replaced my commandments with the stuff that you came up with on your own to control people. See, he knew that they would use that leverage to control people. Interesting. Any other questions, comments? Uh, here's what I wrote down, what we learned today. Three things as usual. Honesty is the best policy in all situations. Don't show partiality to someone, whether rich or poor. Scripture says God is not a respecter of persons. You know, if you're rich and famous versus an ordinary Joe, there's no difference in God's love for you. So I think that's important. And then two, serving the Lord with gladness and being kind to one another results in good health, in happiness, and a balanced life. And then three, God hates sin. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus Christ, the blessed Lamb of God, shed his blood for our forgiveness once and for all who will come. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the lessons you give us in these wonderful scriptures. Lord, thank you for someone like Moses, courageous and loving and obedient. Lord, he was a tremendous leader for your people. And Lord, we thank you that you loved us enough. Like it says in Romans 5 eight, you loved us enough that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to become perfect to be accepted by you, but it is the gift of eternal life through faith and trust in your only son. And it's in his name we pray. I bless every person in this room and those watching on YouTube. Father, I pray that you would give them good health and happiness and bless them and their families. And we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. 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 We'll see you next week.